Th thanks for the uh, very enthusiastic. <laughs> to, to be fair, it's, it's quite early. Um, well, so yeah, I didn't expect to have this many people in the room, but, but that's uh, pretty awesome. So uh, yes, um, my name is, is uh, Jamel Harris. Some people here might know me as, as Jay Harris, to be honest. Jay is a bit easier to remember, so I tend to go with that. This talk, we are going to do an introduction to, um, to Frida. I really like Frida. I use it a lot. Uh, I use it a lot to help me when I'm reverse engineering applications. How many people in this room have used Frida before? Yeah, okay, cool. And how many have used it only on mobile applications? Okay, and who's used it and something, on something else? A little bit, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, we're gonna look at practical demonstrations. I really like to do practical things. It does mean that there is a chance things will, will go wrong and things will break. We'll just have to kind of see how things go. We're gonna be looking at using a free dot on Linux and a little bit of Android uh, towards the end. Now, this isn't an exploitation workshop uh, talk. Um, we're going to be using Frida. Frida can be helpful in exploiting software, but you know we're not going to be looking at actual exploitation. This is just using Frida to help us reverse an application. Um, so, yeah, so uh, who am I? I'm a pen tester, and I, I do security research for digital interruption. Um, this is a, a company that I started in order to try and help left shift security testing and actually I think something like Frida is a really useful tool for, for trying to do that. I'm interested in mobile, which is how I got, uh, first started using Frida. Uh, I also quite like radio things and just reverse engineering generally. Some Twitter uh, accounts you should definitely follow because I'm trying to beat somebody in, in my Twitter account. So uh, if you just add, add a couple more ads, I'm sure I'll get there. Uh, I run a group in Manchester called Manchester Grey Hats. This is where we, we run workshops. Uh, we compete in CTFs. We have a Slack and Twitter account and things. If you want to follow, definitely feel free. We post uh, videos of our workshops and we live stream our workshops as well. Really, it's just a way to try and um, increase the you know, cybersecurity knowledge uh, in, in Manchester. But, but really, we want everyone to, to be free to, to join it. Okay, so first, you know, what is reverse engineering? We want, so when we're reverse engineering something, we want, we want to try and reproduce information about the application uh, based on the knowledge that we extract from it. Uh, so we want to understand the behavior of the binary. This can be useful in things like malware analysis or cracking software. In this talk, we're going to look at one aspect of, um, of reverse engineering. So we're going to look at runtime analysis. The other, the other type of thing, static analysis, where we're looking at source code. Well, um, Frida isn't always super helpful for that. But we're going to be looking at you know, running an application, trying to understand how it works. Um, yeah, so sometimes it does make sense to look at more of a static analysis type of thing. Uh, if you are looking at malware, for example, it might, it might detect that it's being analyzed, and so it might behave differently. So yeah, sometimes you want to look at static, sometimes um, running it is, is the best way. Um, reverse engineering can be quite difficult. You know, why do we want to do it? Well, source code recovery is quite a big one. Let's say we have an application, we don't know how it works, we, uh, but we want to kind of modify it uh, or try and uh, turn the application back into some kind of source code. Well, we're going to need to, to reverse engineer it. We might have applications that we need to know how they interact with each other uh, and change the way they interact with, it, with each, either, each other. Or maybe an application um, you know, is, is old and outdated and we want to be able to interact with it in, in some way. Uh, we need to understand the protocol that it's using and how it, it works together. Um, I find it really fun, to be honest. It's nice to understand how things that kind of work on the inside. And of course, when you're looking for vulnerabilities, Reverse engineering is, is one of the most useful uh, tools that, that we kind of have to our disposal. So, Frida helps with. Um... Okay, so actually, let me ask a question. How many developers are in the room? Yeah? Okay, so application hooking is a really useful technique um, that can uh, allow us to add logging maybe into an application. So as a developer, you might want to use something like Frida 
to add uh, logging into a production version uh, of a, a binary. Uh, so you don't actually have to have logging statements inbuilt into the binary as it's deployed, but you can use something like Frida to add those in later. Uh, how many hackers are in the room? I guess there'd be quite a lot, right? Yeah, come on, I expect most hands to go up. Um, so you can use something like application hooking for uh, disabling SSL pinning in, in mobile applications. That's something that I, I use Frida for a lot. Um, I used application hooking to uh, simulate malicious input once from a Bluetooth uh, device. So rather than actually having to create the Bluetooth device, I could hook the, hook the application to uh, kind of give it, uh, to kind of simulate that. <coughs> and what about like just general like software testers in the room? Does anyone do software testing? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you can use some like application hooking to uh, almost in inject errors into the, into the application to see, uh, to see, uh, to, to get it to kind of, you know, force errors and, and to change the state. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Feel free to just ask questions, by the way, as, as we go along. So, if we have an application that makes a uh, makes a call to a, a function, it tends to look something like this. So we'll have, uh, you know, a call to read, for example, and it will have a you know a, a jump to a, a part of code that gets executed. Okay, so, um, and then we have the same here for uh, for uh, for in this, this encrypt function. So the application will start executing some code. It will see a call to a function. It will jump to to in memory where that function is, which which might be in the library or it might actually just be uh, in the, in the main binary. When we hook an application, we're actually changing the address that that code jumps to. So where uh, so where it might jump to the read function normally, we're going to give it maybe a different address or a different bit of code to execute. So if we do this, we can actually change the behavior of that function that gets executed. Or what we might do, and as we can see in the second case, is you know do something like add logging, um, change the arguments to the original function that gets called. Right? Does that make sense? So we can, um, we can start to either replace the functions or add some stuff to it so that gets executed before or after the original function gets called, okay? So before Frida came along, this is kind of how I felt a lot of the time when I was trying to do um, reverse engineering and trying to do application hooking. It's a very uh, clunky, convoluted process because what you'd have to do is you'd maybe decompile a binary or look through some source code or something. Um, you would have to write the method for the, the, the hook all right, probably in something like C um, or the Java if you use something like exposed for Android. They'd have to compile it. Um, you'd have to load that function. Then you'll obviously have to make a change, have to compile it again. Um, and it was this very like uh, kind of long convoluted approach to it. I remember I was looking at a, um, actually, actually, so I was doing some research into Android Wear when it first came out. And I was using Exposed, which is a, another hooking framework for Android. And that this was before Frida was really a thing. And uh, it took me so long to get anything working in any kind of meaningful way, because I'd have to restart the Android device every single time I made a change to the hook. Now you can imagine as you're kind of iterating through understanding the application, every time you make a small change, you have to re uh, recompile it, redeploy it, restart the app. So um, restart the, the device. So it, it, it took, you know, days and days and days to do anything really meaningful. Um, then Frida came along and it's a bit more like this, honestly. So what took me days or maybe weeks before using uh, older frameworks like Exposed or using older methods can take minutes using Frida. So Frida is a toolkit for instrumentation. Uh, with Frida, we can inject our own scripts into, uh, actually, I'll I tell you what it says on, on the Frida website. Uh, inject your own scripts into black box processes, hook any function, spy on crypto APIs, or trace private application code. No source code needed. Edit, hit save, and instantly see the results, all without compilation steps or program restarts. Like, how cool is that, right? Um, 
So Frida is a framework that lets us do that. Uh, it lets us inject JavaScript into an application. Why JavaScript? Well, I think why not? It's a good language. It's, it's easy to write. It's easy to read. And um, I think most people are familiar enough with JavaScript that, that it kind of makes sense. <laughs> More importantly, Frida is actually a framework to build our own tools. And I don't really see a lot of people doing this, and I think they should be. Frida is great as it is, but I think it really shines when you actually start to use it to, to build your own, own tools. And that's something that I want to try and encourage more people to start doing. You know, for example, you could, you could have, um, you know, if you're a software tester, for, for example, you might have a, you, you might use Frida to, to build an application <laughs> Uh, that inject specific errors into your into your app, or if you're a hacker, maybe you want to have application that uh, disables SL self in 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 all cases and things. So yeah, people should be using Frida um, to actually try and build their own apps. This is basically how it how it looks. Um, we have our process, and with Frida, we can inject the job the JavaScript V8 engine into it. Uh, that loads um, our JavaScript that we're using to, to hook that, that we use to specify what we want to get hooked and the functionality that get, should get injected and changed. Um, and then on the host, uh, we have this way of communicating between the process and and the Frida um, the Frida tool. So whether that's the command line, uh, sorry, the interactive shell, or however we we're hosting Frida. Um, so you can you and you can interact with these uh, between these, and it uses JSON basically just to send data back and forth. So a lot of people do only really use Frida for mobile applications, and as I said before, that's really why I started using it. But actually, it supports lots of different things. So um, it supports obviously Windows um, app applications, macOS, Linux, uh, obviously iOS, Android, and QNX as well. I'm sure you know within time even even that will, will kind of expand. Excuse me, even that will expand. Unfortunately, I don't think there is .NET support. Um, I was trying to do uh, do some .NET stuff a little while back, and I was like, oh yeah, she's free though. No, it didn't work. So we're going to look at a fake application. Okay, this is one I, I wrote. Uh, the, the source code for it is online if you want to play along uh, with it after this talk. And I feel free just to get it off. Um, the, I think the Deep Disruption GitHub repo is on there somewhere, but I'll share all the stuff. So we have this this you know target application that we're going to look at. So this is what it what it does basically. Um, it will ask the user for some kind of message, and then it will create a key, and then it will encrypt that message with that key, and then save it. It just it's just in memory. It's a, a bit of a um, you know. Not a particularly useful application, but it will let us play with Frida and see how Frida can be useful in something like this. Um, if you enter the correct password in the application, it will decrypt the messages. And if you don't know the password, uh, it, it obviously won't. The password is just hard coded into the application. Okay, so let's I jump over and I'll show you that in action, and then we can we can start using Frida. Uh, now, bear with me because. Looking at it on the screen and trying to type and all the things can be a bit difficult. Um, let, let's, let's do our best. <coughs> okay, so. So we just enter some, you know, some strings. All right, ask for us for a password. We get that wrong and we, we can't, we, we're not able to view the messages. Uh, if you do the same thing, and the password obviously is password, you can see the, script, the, the strings are decrypted. Okay. Now we want to try and uh, this, so this is the application we're going to use to just play around with. So let's start that again. Can everyone see the screen? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's do. Uh, 
Okay, so we've started Frida. This is the interactive shell, um, and it has injected that V8 engine, the JavaScript engine, into the target process. So in this case, exercise. You can specify the process ID, and you can use Frida to launch the application as well, but I most of the time honestly just find it uh, more useful to to attach to it by, you know, by, by the name than, than the process ID and things. Um, so let, you know, let, let's try and you know, probe the application and see what we can, we can start to learn about it. So we can do things like this, process.get current uh, thread ID, okay? Uh, process dot enumerate modules. So these are obviously the libraries that the um, application is, is using. And you should be able to see actually here, um, I think the Frida, yeah, so the Frida agent as well, because it's obviously <laughs> injected that into the application now. Oops. Uh, so we can do something as well like this. We can go, we want to enumerate the, uh, you know, exported functions from, from this library. Cool. So we've got addresses and stuff. We can kind of see. so we can we can use this to build a picture of how the application is working and, and what it's doing. All right, because we understand we can see what the libraries it's using um, and things like that. So let's try and do something kind of cool, something a bit more useful. So you know, I know how the application works. It's not a complicated one. So either you know by viewing the source code or um, making some educated guesses or by decompiling it, you, you will see that, you know, it's using some kind of key, right, and doing some kind of encryption. When I see something like that, I almost, like, I'm always confident that the random function is going to be used, right? It may, it may, uh, sorry, the, yeah, so, like, if you're doing crypto, you need some random stuff a lot of the time to generate keys. So, something like that is, is usually in use. So, what I'm going to say here is... We want to change. So when rand is called, we want to change the return value. Rather than being a random number, we're just going to change it to return zero. Okay. So every time rand is called within our, our application, zero is returned. Okay. So now we'll try and enter some messages. Okay. Don't know what the password is. Okay, but we're still able to view the messages because what we've done is we've changed Frida so that, or we've used Frida to change the application so that the key is always going to be zero, so null bytes. And of course, when you XOR uh, the, the message and the, the key and the key is zero, the message doesn't, doesn't change. Okay, makes sense to everyone? Yeah, okay, awesome. That's the first demo and there were kind of no, no errors there, nothing broke, that's good. So by the way, my um, laptop used to crash a lot and I thought I fixed it because it hadn't happened for like six months. And then when I was preparing for this this morning, the laptop crashed. So let's hope that doesn't happen again later. Uh, Frida Trace. Uh, this is actually written using Frida. And when you install Frida, it gets installed along with it. What it does is it creates JavaScript files for um, for functions based on their name, which, which is, is super awesome. And I'll show you it in a little while. Um, and basically, what it'll do, it'll, it'll add logging into your application. Uh, so you can do something like free to trace dash i, uh, and then the name of a function that you want to uh, start put, uh, that you want to start logging, um, and it will generate those JavaScript files for you to, to start doing that. And you can do star as well, so it'll just start logging every function that gets called. Uh, this doesn't always work; sometimes th things crash, uh, but it is it is still like a really awesome feature especially when you don't know about an application when you're first starting off. Um, yeah, so it's really good for kind of exploring an application. This is the type of thing that Frida Trace will create. So if we have this function here, uh, here, so making a call to a function encrypt message, it will generate this JavaScript with an on enter and on leave function. Uh, and it will just add some logging into on enter. So obviously on enter gets called when the application, uh, when the function is about to be called, and then on leave after the function has been called. <coughs> okay. 
if we want to, uh, so one useful thing is to actually modify that JavaScript once it's been created. If we want to start to access the arguments, Frida actually gives us um, this args array because Frida won't know about the function, right? Before, uh, you know, when we run Frida Trace, it'll we'll know the name of it, but it won't understand the, the arguments that it's using and things like that. Um, so what it gives us is just a uh, an array to the arguments. And then what we can do within the JavaScript is actually start to, to just, you know, log them and, and index into them and things. Uh, so if we wanted to look at this key, we could just say log args1. So let's say we wanted to, so yeah, let's say we wanted to change the return value here as well. We're also able, as we saw before, using the interactive shell, we're also able to just do, uh, you know, rep val dot, dot replace, and we add that into the JavaScript uh, on the on the function, and then this here will be whatever we, we put in there. It's a bit more difficult if you want to, if you have something like, like this, where we have a buffer and the buffer is filled in the function, right? So if we have something like here, encrypt message, where we pass in you know, a message, a key, and then the buffer, when we, when we create this, this buffer is obviously just gonna be bits of memory, you know, it's not really being filled with anything. And if it gets filled, uh, if it gets um, used in this encrypt message thing, then it will add data into that, that buffer. So with Frida, what we can do is we can just do, you know, this dot buff, or you can give it any name really, this dot whatever, equals the argument you want, so buffer, and then on leave, you, we can we can look at that again. So obviously, if we try to log it here, we're just going to see garbage because the buff, buff hasn't been used yet. Um, really, we want to view it after it's been populated. So we, we, can, we can do things like this. So let's take a look. Okay, so again, let's uh, start the application and you know, let's say we don't really know much about this app yet, but you know, we've played around with it. We know that it's probably going to use a random function and it's going to use something like read because it takes data in from, from standard in. So what we're going to say is free to trace, you know, rand, we can, and again, we can use um, use stars to, to say anything with rand in, in the function name uh, also the read function and then of course the name of the the, the, the process so trace all these things cool um, and we just and you can see it starts to, to log stuff so for some functions it will know things about them um, which is which is cool so it already prints you know some of the the, the arguments that we're sending to it uh, but for others, it, it, it won't have any knowledge. So let's try and do what we did before using the interactive shell. But now we can we can start to actually modify this um, JavaScript that gets created. And this is the the way I tend to do things. You now I'm, I'm using Freedom to learn about the application. I start logging things, make some educated guesses, and then I'll just start to modify the JavaScript to start to print um, print the arguments or change some of the the, the logic. So let's look at this one. Okay, so as we saw before, this is the on enter function. Mm -hmm. So this is where it just adds uh, some some logging, so we know that it's been called, and then on leave is is empty. Uh, but let's change that so we can do uh, <coughs> ret val dot replace. So. One thing that I really love is you can just save the file and it gets loaded automatically. So it's already made that change now. So if we to the wrong password, yeah. 
So of course here was before we started uh, attach before we attached with Frida. Um, and here is where we've actually changed the that random function to return zero. Yeah. Any questions? Oh, okay, awesome. So let's I want to show something a bit more realistic, okay? Um, who's used Pigeon before? Yeah, so it's like an instant messenger app thing. Uh, so I used to use it for, for IRC. So I've started actually just an IRC um, server locally, and now I'm going to start Pigeon, hopefully. Uh, Here's Pigeon. <clears throat> so let's say that I want to start to explore uh, Pigeon using Frida. What I might do is something like this. Right, so if I want to look at the IRC stuff, I'm going to make an assumption that some of the methods, uh, some of the functions it is called, is going to have IRC in, in the name. So I just say Frida trace on IRC. In, in Pigeon, and it creates a load of stuff. Okay, then I will do some things in the application, you know, that that use IRC. So let's try and join a channel test. And we'll just, you know. and we can see that's actually starting to to log some of those functions, right? So yes, okay. That I, I assume some of these might be be quite interesting. So let's try and maybe look at uh, IRC send. Okay, so this is, again, it's just adding some logging, but we now have the ability to to look at some of the arguments and to change the return um, the return data and, and things like that. So after reading through some of the source code for Pigeon, I came up with this. Okay, so basically the first argument is this IRC uh, connection object and within that is the, the account information and then within the object and then within that is like the username and other things. So, oops. so, so there. okay. So, um, so I've just added some extra logging into it, and you can see here, you know, like we uh, we don't need to to know really, uh, you know, we can just say, you know, that if we know what the object looks like and know how to index it and things, even though Pigeon is using its, its own uh, its own objects, we can still, uh, you know, reference them and, and use them. So let's take a look. <laughs> okay. okay, so now we're starting to see some of the information that is that is being sent uh, to this function. Okay, so let's try something else. Let's try and actually modify some of that data. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to just change uh, a couple of bytes in the message. All right, so what we're going to do is just change the first two bytes um, of the message we're sending to just be you know, 41, 41. And then again, then we're going to log it kind of before and after. Okay, so uh, oh, weird. And you can see we've actually changed the, the data that's being sent. Now, you should be able to see at this point how this could be a really cool way to write a fuzzer, right? Because we're actually able to modify the data using Frida. So here, yep, yeah, okay, it's just some ASCII we're changing, but you know, imagine if we're changing the length value or we're changing the object in, in some more interesting way. So yeah, super easy way to, to start to, to do that kind of vulnerability analysis on an application. Yep, everyone understand? Cool. Um, 
So to use feeder trace, we require a function name, as we saw. <laughs> When we're, using an, when we're trying to hook an imported function um, using feeder trace, it's, uh, it's really straightforward. Right? We know the name of the function. It's RAND or it's read or IRC or whatever. Um, if it's an internal function, things are a little bit different. Um, you, you need to have the address of the function. Uh, I use something like object dump to, to get that. Right? So I'm just going to show you that now because that was something that kind of threw me for a bit. So in our... Uh, in fact, let me just close some of these things. So, uh, where was I? Okay, so um, let's say that I want to, you know, after, again, after reversing the application, maybe I see there's a um, function encrypt string. I can use object dump to to get the address of that, that function, okay? <coughs> then, using Frida, or free to trace. I can just say, so rather than dash i, it's dash a in this case. Um, and I can say hook on this address. Uh, actually, I need to start. start that. Okay. So and it'll, again, it'll just create the, the same JavaScript file for us. Okay, but now it's inside um, an internal function. So one that's not being imported from a, a library. And of course, it starts to log it. So that's, what, that's on the encrypt string function. So we can obviously at that point start adding some kind of logging to that, uh, to that if we need to. So. So you see, we're now starting to log some of those arguments. Um, let's let's take a look at some another function there. So let's say we want to start hooking the check password function, okay? Because again, we reverse the application. We started to um, decompile it, maybe, or how you know how we go about doing that. And we realize that the um, or maybe just run strings on it, right? And we see there's a function check password. So again, we have the address now, and we can use free to trace to <coughs> to generate this for us. We open it, and this is a check password function. So when you see something like a check password function, what's it going to be doing, right? I mean, who wants to guess how it's going to work? Yeah, exactly. So um, let's let's do something like this. Let's say that whenever check password gets called, we're always going to just return true. So that's information, password, whatever, and it still decrypts it because it you know it's going to check the password and say, okay, yeah, this is this is always true. So again, you know, there are other ways to do things like this. You know, you could patch it, you could um, you know, use some other tools, but see, you see how quick it is to do you know, something like Frida. Okay, so just saw the demo. Uh, Frida is scriptable as well, which is awesome. Um, it has bindings for Node, uh, for Python, .NET, and QML, and some other things. Uh, so you can use, so I like to use Python a lot, um, and I use Python, so I use uh, the, bind, the Python binding, so I can write my code in Python to start to control Frida and start to inject uh, JavaScript into it. 
this is the template that I tend to use. So it will have a, um, so we're gonna say, you know, attach to a specific process, um, load this script here, um, so the script here. And this can either be, you know, either hard coded in or maybe you know, just have the JavaScript file on disk yourself. Okay, so we will look at this again in a little while, um, but just to jump quickly to speak about Android, um, within Frida, uh, so, so obviously Frida has support for Android and, and iOS. This is this tends to, uh, this is kind of how it works. You have the Frida server running on the app, on the device, um, and then that will um, that will inject the JavaScript engine into the process that we're looking at, and then again the host. Uh, like before, but this time we're using something like ADB to uh, communicate between the two. All right, so this is um, this is for uh, when you're running on a rooted device, so you can actually have the Frida server running as a uh, binary on that device. You can also use Frida on non-rooted devices, and this is some, something that a lot of people aren't really doing yet, and they should be because a lot of times when I'm doing a pen test on a mobile device, it, ha it has root detection. The application has root detection. You know, it might be like a banking application. Um, yeah, it kind of sucks that they, they do that, but I understand why they want to check if root's there. So if I'm on a device that ha look at doing, looking at an application that has root detection in, I obviously can't just run the Frida server because it requires root. So there is another way to add that, um, to add Frida into an application. And when you do it that way, you don't need to uh, run it on a rooted device. Uh, so just, just in brief, the way that it works is you, um, you add the, uh, library, the free library into the APK, so into the Android application, you patch the application to just load that library, and then when you install the app, it starts Frida, okay, and you don't need Frida to do that. You can, yes, but the, uh, it can be like a bit annoying because you need to figure out how to do it first before you can start using Frida, and obviously you can't use Frida to figure it out, so, so it can be it can be done. It's a bit of a pain. It's better to just to just do it this way so that you don't even need to bother about that. And then of course you can start to bypass the other controls that you need to, so such as pinning or other security things. Uh, what is is a is a problem when you have um, then have like uh, tamper detection or something where it detects whether the application has been modified. Because if it does that and root detection, uh, it becomes a bit of a pain. Um, so, let's take a quick look at some some Android stuff. Okay, so So, I tend to. This is where I tend to use, you know, these, these Python bindings a bit, a bit more, to be honest. Um, so what we do is we're just gonna. So the the app that we're playing with, I've, I've added Frida into it, and you can get that online. I think again on the, the Decent Interruption uh, GitHub um, page. I think it has a this APK. Um, it's actually one I wrote a few years ago for uh, B sides London. So it's just a like a. a testing application for like a challenge. So this application, let me just um, try and bring it up. Where is it? All right, so basically you start it, you need to know some pin to log in. And the challenge was to, you know, try try and try and find out how to get that pin or, or log in without knowing it. So we can actually use Frida to to help us with that. So, okay, I'm not sure why the formatting here is a bit weird, but maybe it's just because I've changed the size of things. Um, but so basically what we're going to say is um, 
you know, attached to the application, right, as, as it, when it's running, and do this thing. And what we're going to do here is we're actually going to try and brute force the pin. Okay, so we're going to just say, you know, check between you know, these values um, and we're going to use the, the function that the application itself is, is using to check whether that's that the pin was right or wrong. Okay, so let's see if this works. <coughs> so I should just be able to do... So I should just be able to do Python. Python. Um, find. Does that work? Oh yeah, okay, so there we go. So basically it was, it was running, it checks all the values, and then when it sees that the login would be successful, um, it just prints the pin, pin up for us. Okay, and that's obviously the pin that I, I created in the application beforehand. So if I try to log in with you know, 2222, it doesn't work, but the pin that we just found, 1234. Obviously, it locks us in. Okay. So the other one that we have here is accept any pin. So again, in, in the same same kind of thing, what this will do is it will just change the implementation of the check auth function to always return true. So let's try it. Let's try that. See if it works. Accept any pin. So let's try uh, two, two, two. For login. Yeah, you see, so anything works. So we've changed the, the implementation of the, the functions inside the Android app. And before that, we actually, um, you know, we were actually using the functions within the application you know, without doing it through the app, we can actually choose freely to call kind of any function that exists within the app, you know, including the, the check auth function with our own arguments. So, um, how do we protect against this? So just for those that are interested, well, there are a few ways. Um, you can look to see whether the free, free the library has been loaded. Uh, it's probably the kind of the most naive, but also the way that will tend to probably work the most. Um, you know, it can be a quite a difficult thing, uh, kind of as, as Tim at the back uh, said, you know, can you just bypass things like root section using Frida? Well, anything that's running on my device, I can do anything to. So eventually I'll, I'll be able to bypass most controls or any control. Um, but then I guess another question is, you know, should we protect against this? Because again, if someone's running the application, it's theirs, they can do whatever they want with it. For some some cases, I think it makes sense to add protections for this kind of thing. Though, if it is a uh, banking application, maybe you want people to um, to have to spend more time, more effort to to find vulnerabilities um, and to start reversing and understand how it works. If you are interested in like more ways to protect against this kind of stuff, on the digital interruption website, there's a white paper on mobile security. Uh, where we've put in some some kind of steps that we recommend and some code snippets and things to to protect against this kind of of, of um the, you know this kind of attack and others. Um, yes, and that's it. So I think we finished a little bit early, which is awesome. I don't know if it was too early. How much time is there left? Fifteen minutes. Okay, so good good amount of time for anyone quite to ask any questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for example. Uh, 
So the question was, uh, once you patch an application, is there any way to, to, to like save it, save the patch? There, no, not that I'm aware of, but that's actually one of the benefits with Frida because it's really easy to load and unload patches to an application. Um, I remember once I was doing a, a, like a mobile test uh, where I had to actually patch the application because it wouldn't let me use Frida. I think they were either protecting against it or something, um, or maybe I just didn't have um, it set up or whatever. But I was patching the application manually and it was a real pain because I wasn't able to switch between the patch and non-patch versions easily. Whereas with Frida, you know, you just close, you just kill it and it's back to normal again. But when it also means that you can apply the patch part way through the application. So maybe you want the check to run normally, you know, a few times and then one time you patch it and do that. So no, not that I'm aware of, but uh, that's why Frida's better for more of this exploratory thing. You know, you're trying to understand that as you go, make the changes as you, as you go, that temporary, you can change them, you can kill them, you can figure out what's going on. And then if you want to patch it properly, you can just, you know, by that point, you know enough to just, to just patch it. Anyone else? Huh? Oh, yeah. Um, what's the experience with using Frida on iOS? So um, I think jailbreaks are getting, are getting more and more rare. They are. Um, I think there are ways to incorporate the Frida library into your application so you do have more than Yes. Um, what the Frida has to do is like I said, like I say, uh, already uh, apps, iOS apps, um, use that from uh, iPhone, for example. So the, the question is about uh, iPhone and Frida and how it's become harder to jailbreak. So, so yeah, because of that, I totally agree. Um, people do need to start thinking about how they can do testing using Frida on non-jailbroken devices. You do need the source code, you need to compile it yourself. So it, it, that only really makes sense when you're doing, you know, a, a pen test for somebody and you can you actually have access to the source code. The, I mean, it does mean that we are still able to do a really good amount of analysis um, using Frida you know, even on non-jailbroken devices. On a jailbroken device, it, it's, it's super easy. So actually I tend to have a couple of devices I use for testing. One is jailbroken, one is not jailbroken, and I use them as needed. But yeah, it's definitely something that people need to be thinking about a bit more now because people aren't really using Frida, I think, as much as they should be. And in the future, I think it's gonna be the only real way we have to, to really analyze an application. But yeah, again, limited to the fact that you need to, need to compile it. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>